Welcome to our first live webinar. My name is Jenny and I'm from BenQ Australia. Joining us today is renowned photographer Mark Gaylor and director of Image Science Jeremy Dala. This webinar will run for 45 minutes with 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. I will hand it over to Mark now who will teach us how to master colours when editing images in Lightroom. We're going to back up first. We're going to look at what color adjustments we can actually do inside of our cameras before we even get the images into Lightroom. Now, what we're prepared to do and what we want to do will depend on whether we're a raw shooter or we're shooting in JPEGs or shooting movies. Now, if you're a raw shooter, the following three controls might seem superfluous, but they do impact to some extent on what we're doing and our workflows. Now, the th first three things I want to talk about are white balance, saturation, and color gamut. Now, these don't flow through to um, the raw files, but if you're using a mirrorless camera and you've got an electronic viewfinder or you're using the monitor, they do flow through to those ways of viewing our scene. Also, many photographers shoot RAW and JPEG and they quickly have to get the JPEG images uh, to their clients, such as sports photographers. So they do need to do some of these color controls actually in camera. So let's look at white balance first. Now, most photographers shoot in auto white balance. Now, there are some ways of fine tuning that auto white balance. It isn't just simply a set and forget setting anymore, especially on the latest cameras. For instance, on my latest Sony cameras, i.e. the ones released in 2019 and afterwards, they have three uh, options for auto white balance, which is standard, ambience and white. Now, if we go into ambience, if we start um, taking photographs using warm tungsten lights, it's gonna leave some of that warmth in the images to give us that character or mood. This might also be appropriate if you're taking photographs in firelight or candlelight. It's gonna leave some of that warmth into the images. If that's not something you want, if you wanna be completely neutral, then you'd choose the white setting uh, so that we got a completely neutral um, atmosphere there. So that's the first thing. Uh, we can also, if we just choose auto white balance, even on the cameras that don't have those options, is we can usually go and fine tune that auto white balance. Some people might say that they feel that the camera shoots images that are slightly cool, whereas we could actually just go in and move that towards the warm end of the spectrum as a starting point. Just remember auto white balance is a variable. It always works on averages. So with that in mind, there are some photographers who don't want to be uh, subjected to those variances in white balance. If you can imagine a wedding photographer shooting, they don't want every shot to be slightly different in the white balance because that's going to cause maybe issues uh, when uh, trying to get that wedding dress looking the same in all files. So those photographers may shoot daylight, shade, cloudy, set on the ambient lighting conditions, and uh, then the white balance won't deviate as we're shooting. Just imagine somebody with a yellow dress appearing right in front of the camera. The white balance, the auto white balance would say, oh, it's looking a bit warm. I'll cool it down. And obviously that would be a mistake. It's not really aware of the content we're putting in front of the frame. Think of it like auto exposure. It gets it right most of the time, but it can make monumental mistakes occasionally. So for those people who are very meticulous, you're not going to shoot with one of those presets. You're actually going to measure uh, the ambient color temperature as we're shooting. And the way of doing that is to create a custom white balance. And I do recommend this for anyone who's maybe shooting videos in particular, is to create a custom white balance is a way where the movie footage won't uh, deviate from um, uh, a standard setting, depending on the content in the frame. So in order to get a really accurate uh, custom white balance, you're going to need to point the camera at something that you know is neutral. Now, one of the products that uh, Jeremy sells is something that does have a white balance reference. And what I'm showing you now on the right is a white balance reference card. So uh, the white balance reference, the custom white balance process, just means that you point a, uh, a square at 
uh, the white balance reference and then it measures the uh, that and tries to make that well it does it makes that neutral so then you've got a custom white balance instead of a white balance preset that you can use now we're going on to number two which is saturation now we're not we've talked about whether it's warm or cool but we also need to know how rich the colors are appearing in the file remember this doesn't follow through to raw files but it is a way of controlling how we're viewing the images as we're taking them uh, on a sony camera you would find that in the creative style menu but these uh, controls will also be available pretty much on all cameras you just got to find out that setting so uh, if i scroll over on my sony camera i can then control contrast sharpness and also saturation so if you feel like the saturation in your viewfinder is too high or too low you can start uh, moving that around now there are some flavors of uh, creative styles such as portrait landscape etc that I as a raw shooter don't use but there is one creative style that could prove useful for some of you and that is there's a creative style which is devoid of color it's actually the black and white creative style so that when we're shooting even in raw we're going to see a, a black and white view on the monitor in the viewfinder but the files that end up in uh, post-production editing software such as Lightroom will still be in color so you might say well what's the point of that mark and the point of that is is we're able to preview visualize our scene we're much more likely to take notice of the light and the shade if we can actually um, get rid of the distraction of color so that it might be something that you want to try if you know you're shooting in black and white the next the third thing is color gamut now this is uh, often referred to as color space on the cameras now uh, the typical default for pretty much most of the cameras you're going to get out of the box and all, all cameras uh, all amateur cameras that don't have this choice will be set to srgb now this is a, a standard space and it's often referred to as a safe rgb color space because it's usually the space that the internet presumes all files or photos going up there occupy this space only problem with this space is it's not very large and it's not really appropriate um, for the bigger richer color saturations that we can achieve when printing so way back in uh, 1998 Adobe uh, created a larger color space uh, called Adobe 19 RGB 1998 there's a little graph on the right side to show you that it's especially bigger in the cyans and uh, greens there and if i come to over to a three-dimensional model some people will have noticed in the bottom right hand corner of this slide uh, i refer to safe rgb and then s something 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 rgb because people who do like to use those broader gamuts have a very derogatory term for srgb now um, this is a three-dimensional model which I pulled up on my Mac computer to show you that the Adobe RGB has 40% more volume for some of those richer colors. Now let's, uh, let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail and compare this to uh, one of my printing profiles that I regularly use. That printing profile is a three-dimensional model, is that color shape on the left there. And you can see the sRGB, which is that white wire frame, is not nearly a big enough to encompass all of the colors that the printer, paper and ink set are capable of producing. So if I'm shooting in sRGB or exporting images to send to the printer as sRGB, I'm shortchanging myself. Let's switch over to the Adobe RGB color gamut. And now you can see that larger white wire frame on the right there is uh, it's pretty much encompassing that printing profile. And it's why Adobe made this move in, way back in 1998. And one of the reasons or one of the questions I often get asked is why on my camera do I have Adobe RGB what's the significance of Adobe well it sort of kick-started photographers being able to access um, uh, an ICC color profile or color managed workflow which is why it's there now some of you might already be saying so if I stick to sRGB or I export images from my software as sRGB is that what's the what's the effect if those colors aren't contained by the gamut 
what happens to them? Do they just fall off the end of the earth or what, what is the impact? So I'm, I've drawn up this uh, demonstration to so, show you what happens to certain colors that are out of gamut. Okay, and that out of gamut colors, those rich saturated reds on the left side there, we don't see any detail in the feather structure anymore. You can have the satura saturation or you can have the detail, but you can't have both. Whereas if we just increase the size of the color gamut to Adobe RGB, we can get rich detail and also saturated colors. I think I'm selling you on Adobe RGB now. And here's the sad news is that most of the vast majority of monitors out there can only achieve approximately the sRGB color space. So even though you've got a camera that can exceed that sRGB, we have monitors that can't showcase the detail in those saturated colors, except there are things called color accurate monitors that pride themselves on having that bigger Adobe RGB color gamut. They've got many other benefits as well, which I've listed there. They're 10 bit rather than 8 bit. And there's many more as well, which we won't have time to get into. Other than to say that the monitor I'm currently using and I'm sitting in front of right now is the BenQ SW271. And Jeremy is going to show you that this isn't the only color accurate monitor. And if you're interested in some other alternatives, he's going to showcase those uh, via a link now. Now, if you don't have uh, one of those color accurate monitors yet, I would advise you just to position the monitor that you do have very carefully in your office or studio space. The image on the left is to show you exactly what you shouldn't do with your monitor. Most um, monitors, including the Apple monitors that I've grown up with, have now got very shiny surfaces. So if you're uh, got it opposite a window, you've got reflections on the monitor surface. If you wear brightly colored clothes, that is going to be included into the monitor. So it's going to skew the way you edit your images. Whereas if you look at one of these color accurate monitors like the BenQ, we have a, a monitor hood and that can help um, uh, get rid of reflections. Also, the surface of that BenQ is not gloss so it's a bit immune from actually showcasing reflections that might be apparent in your room i think that hood is about as important as a lens hood on a capture lens uh, i would not i would not buy a monitor without one of those lens hoods these days next thing to do is if you don't have one of the color accurate monitors is certainly calibrate and profile your monitor because most monitors that you purchase are way way off from being accurate they're way too bright they're way too blue and you can't really get an accurate idea of what you're doing if you can't see the colors accurately now the BenQ color accurate monitors, they come out of the box 98% accurate. But even then, you'd be well uh, advised to invest in a monitor calibration device. These monitor calibrators, the most important thing they do is not their calibration, it's the profiling. It gets the colors organized so that they can be accurate when compared to each other. Now, the great thing about the Adobe software is once it can work with a profile, it knows how bad your monitor is. It knows if one of the colors is inaccurate and it pulls it back into line on the fly. So you're only ever presented with color accurate colors even though your monitor might be slightly skewed. Now, if you think that's a good idea, why not complete the picture? Why not profile your camera? Now, there are many people on the forums going, oh, my camera's got the best skin tones. I wouldn't move over to your camera, make because your skin tones on that camera isn't as good as my camera. That argument should have died in 1998 because if you profile all of the cameras, the cameras won't have a flavor of color, they will be accurate color. And so the device, uh, um, which is a mixture of hardware and software that does this, that I use, is a color checker passport. Now it is over a hundred dollars, but you know, it's a set, it's, it's gonna last you a long time. Every time you buy a new camera, you can just create what's called a dual illuminant profile. You don't have to go out on location with it every time just create a profile which is more accurate because it's unique to your specific camera and that is the advantage there and if you're going to complete the chain again if you print to your own printer or you print to a print service provider like image science 
get hold of one of their profiles. Now, uh, in the, the profiling equipment for profiling a printer is a tad on the expensive side, but you can actually profile your printer just by downloading a print profile target from somewhere like Image Science, send them back your target print after you've followed the directions about how to print it, and then somebody like Jeremy will send you the profile back in the mail. So you don't actually have to buy the gear at all, but you can still acquire a color accurate monitor for your printer. Now, I've skipped over that very quickly, but if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about that, I've got a free to download color management for photographers ebook on my website, markgaylor.com. Okay, let's move over to the hero of the piece, which is uh, we're talking about um, uh, Lightroom, how we can now control and uh, uh, edit with color in Lightroom. Now, you, you may have heard me say that uh, Lightroom is a non-linear editing program. It really doesn't matter where we start and finish the editing. Start with any slider you like. I would uh, uh, say that if you are going to start anywhere, however, is I would start by looking at the profiles your image editing software is using. Because the raw data you're going to edit is never left in completely raw state, it's partially cooked by your editing software, whether it be Capture One or whether it be Lightroom, it starts off being slightly edited and presented to you in a more manageable way. And the way that uh, Lightroom has been doing this, uh, it used to be something called Adobe Standard. People used to complain that the starting look wasn't as good as Capture One because the colors didn't look very vibrant. So Adobe made a bit of a change and the current starting profile is Adobe Color but you don't have to accept this as the starting point because you can override the starting point. Now, if you're running with the latest um, uh, Lightroom versions, you would just look to the right of the profile and look for those four little grid squares there. That is your profile browser. That allows you to pick an alternative. Now, you'll have more than half a dozen various options from Adobe, but you'll also have some uh, camera matching profiles available to you as well to see an alternative way of starting. For instance, there's one there in the bottom right-hand corner called Light. So if you're always thinking your shadows are a little bit dark, um, then maybe you could choose light and the shadows will be a little bit lighter. It's like having dynamic range optimizer assigned to your raw files because dynamic range optimizer in the camera doesn't actually affect the raw files. I don't need to do that, however. I've created a custom profile with my color checker and I can now pick up my camera specific profile from this area. So I'm just going to pick it up here and because I'm going to be using this profile a lot, I'll click in the top right hand corner to add it to my favorites. As soon as I've added it to my favorites, I don't need to come to the profile browser anymore. I can simply access it from the drop down menu. Now, if all of that sounds a little bit too much, am I really going to change the color profile every time I edit an image? That sounds like it's going to be a waste of time. Now, this is where we're getting to is you can if you create a new default you don't actually have to remember to do it every time you import a batch of images from a memory card they will acquire your new default your new preferred profile you might also want to write in a few other things into this new default just remember when you're starting to create a new default just reset a file completely so you have no adjustments and then pick very carefully what adjustments you want to be part of the new default because they'll be applied by default to every image you now import. So I, one of the things you might want to do is uh, chromatic aberration on the lens corrections. It is possible on the Sony cameras to uh, apply this in camera, but if you've switched it off, then you can apply it in post-production. If you have a Lightroom will let you know it's already been applied. A little information down there, I for information, will let you know if you click on it that the profile has been applied in camera.
Okay, now we're set to create that new default. If you're working on Lightroom software that predates 2019, you'll just hold down the Alt key on a PC, Option key on a Mac, and you'll see a, um, a set default button appear in the bottom right hand corner of your develop module, and then you can create or update to current settings, and that becomes your new develop default. Every time you import images or hit reset, that will be the starting point. Now, they, unfortunately, Adobe Lightroom did make it a little bit more complicated. There's a few more options, so it's a little bit more flexible, but there's a few more steps with uh, the latest versions of Lightroom. So the first thing you have to do with the current versions is create a preset that includes your camera profile and uh, maybe your lens corrections as well. And then you'll need to go into preferences um, go to presets, click on the use default specific to camera model checkpoint, choose your camera model number two, then you'll go over and choose the preset that you just created. And you should be able to find that just by cycling around. It might appear in the user um, presets if you didn't create a new folder for it. And then number four, and finally, you just hit the create default button and now the work is done. I would check that out however, just take any file captured with that camera, hit the reset, reset button and just see whether your camera no longer reverts to Adobe Color but reverts to the profile that you prefer. Okay, let's go and do some creative editing now. We'll start with Y balance, which is one of the things that we could assign in camera. And I did say this would be used as a reference in the raw editors. We can change it and it doesn't, and it won't uh, negatively impact the raw file if we do change it. But the starting point will use that white balance. And so we have the white balance called as shot. Now, what has happened here, we're, we're just moving into blue hour here with this image. And so the camera has seen all of the blue and go, oh, that's too cool. I'll warm it up a bit, thinking it's doing the right thing because the camera doesn't really know about blue hour. So it's made this a little bit too warm. So that uh, invites me to grab the temperature slider and drag it to the left to make it cooler to put the blue back in where it belongs and that also gives me these nice complementary colors between warm skin tones and that blue sky in the background here's another uh, blue hour shot um, captured from the top of eureka tower in melbourne again a lot of blue so the camera auto white balance goes i think i'll add some orange okay but i have to fight that and uh, again drag that uh, temperature slider down to put the blue back in so we get the blue hour look to my shot and i also get the added advantage of again putting in those complementary colors Let's look at uh, one more. This was uh, captured on Anzac Day a couple of years back. Now it's a cold, wet day in Melbourne, but I'm not getting that blue, cold look in the background. So what I'll do is drag that white balance uh, temperature slider down again to push back in that color. Notice the warm tones, the very warm tones that are a bit immune to this. So we can actually push in some blue without uh, making the skin tones look too cool. Now, one final one, you think I'm only adjusting the temperature slider. Here I'm at uh, Bustleton Jetty in Western Australia. Now, this was the as shot. And what I've decided to do this time is move the tint slider. Now, this might not necessarily be absolutely 100% faithful to the blue tones in the scene. But what I'm doing is I'm forcing the complementary colors. So I'm using white balance more of as a creative tool rather than a tool to create absolute accuracy. And uh, to show you how, <laughs> how much we can use that as a creative tool, um, here I am in some sand dunes which are warm by default, but here I'm reminded of waves in the ocean. So I've actually pulled that temperature down to make these sand dunes cold and blue, and I've called this image the Sea of Tranquility. So as an artist, we have freedom of expression, so you could choose to be accurate or you could choose to use color as an emotive tool. And you have only have to look at the Hollywood movies to know that Hollywood uses that creatively every second movie you watch. Now, 
We've done some global edits using white balance. Let's do some targeted adjustments using the hue, saturation and luminance panel. A very, very powerful panel here. Now, if you're a photojournalist, you can't actually do what I'm about to do because your image is a faithful record. It's a piece of evidence, if you like, that this actually occurred. But if you come from an advertising, editorial or arts perspective, then you could do what I'm about to do, which is to say Gilbert Namala here, who is um, being photographed by me. I actually don't like his shirt and I don't actually want to go and tell him to change his shirt. If this was a Hollywood movie, wardrobe would just whip in and change the shirt for him. But I'm going to change his shirt in post-production just by grabbing the colors and desaturating those blues, because for me, they don't belong. Gilbert Namala is still Gilbert Namala. We're just not distracted by his shirt anymore. Here's a, uh, an image that I captured at uh, Melbourne Zoo. Now, I always associate meerkats with Africa and uh, the golden savanna, uh, except we've got this bright green grass in the background, which I don't think actually uh, looks correct. So again, what I've done is I've just gone into this image, targeted those um, greens, moved them to yellow using the hue control, and then uh, grabbed the saturation and dragged those down. And now everyone's looking at the meerkat and is not distracted by that bright green grass. Now we can actually target those colors even when we can't see any color at all. If we're in black and white, we can actually still move colors uh, we can move their luminance values specifically. So here's the image with a straight black and white conversion. I want the sky to be darker. So I just grab the luminance of those blues and aquas and drag them to absolute black. And that's quite a quick edit there. So we've got a, a really fantastic image now, almost like a studio image uh, of this bird on a black background. Now we've done targeted adjustments using HSL. Let's try some localized adjustments using the graduated radial and adjustment brush. I'll, I've only got time to do one, so I'll, I'll concentrate on the graduated filter. Most of you have probably used graduated filters in post to darken the top of the sky. Now what I'm doing is I'm darkening the top of the sky by one stop, but I'm also making it blue. Again, the sun has set. So we're moving into that nice transition where we got the glow of the setting sun, but we're going over to that blue. But because I've used a telephoto lens, I'm actually shot underneath the blue. So you can't see the blue that I'm experiencing. So I just bring it down, I bring it lower so you can get the feeling uh, of what it is that I'm photographing. Okay, let's look at toning now. Now in the basic panel, we have two very powerful sliders, saturation and vibrance. Saturation just grabs all of the colors, doesn't matter whether they're saturated or just slightly saturated, just pulls them all at the same level. So it can push saturated colors out of gamut. So vibrance tends to have the best algorithms because it'll try and prevent um, colors from being dragged out of gamut. But it's also good in the opposite way because if we drag the vibrance down, it will almost fully desaturate the colors of low saturation, but it'll leave some color in the most vibrant colors left. If we then move the saturation slider to the right, we can actually restore the colors of those most saturated colors where the rest of the palette almost becomes monochrome. And this can be a very powerful tool for just restricting the color palette to fewer colors. And this is a very common grading tool that I lean on a lot in my images. Okay, so let's take another look at uh, using that vibrant slider. Here's a full color version now. I think there's a few too many colors and because we're in a park, even though we're in the shade, there's some greens creeping in, which I'm not very happy with. So because they were lowly saturated greens, I've pulled them out using the vibrance and I've moved the temperature slider up to create some warmer tones, which creates this semi sepia look. Now the semi sepia look isn't starting with a monochromatic black and white image, it's starting with a full color image with lower vibrance. So this allows me to do things like this, where we've got lips of a slightly different hue and we've got eyes also of a slightly different color. So I think this is more powerful than creating a sepia effect from a monochromatic or grayscale image. 
Finally, we're going to look at a very powerful tool that Hollywood leans on a lot. The interface looks very different. Typically in movie editing software, we have wheels, but in, in Lightroom and Photoshop, we have these color ramps. Now, the idea for this is we leave an image in color, but we skew the highlights and the shadows in complementary directions. So it's very typical to put the skin tones warmer and the shadow tones cooler. Now, this has got a very um, uh, famous name in Hollywood. It's called orange and teal grading. And this is a very common grading style that Hollywood use. And so this is me grading this image with orange and teal. Um, and uh, we can get a little bit more character and mood and a little bit more of a signature style going on. Now let's um, split tone this on a black and white image this time, just to show you how this process works. First, we pick a color for the highlights. I'm picking a warm color. Then we'll pick a color for the shadows, a complementary blue or cyan color. We also have a balance slider where we can put more of the colors towards highlights or more of the colors towards shadows, where we basically can manage where those midtones sit. Now, I've got some uh, presets that include split toning available on my website. They're free to download, and then you just donate what, they, what you think they're worth. So if you don't like using them, don't donate anything. If you use them all of the time, consider shouting me a coffee. That's all you need. Let's look at the final step of the color managed workflow here. We've captured the images, we've graded the images, now we're outputting the images. Now the important thing to know is Lightroom will always look after you because it embeds uh, the color profile that you are using on export. So typically it will um, embed an sRGB profile by default, which is a safe one, but you could override that and go out with an Adobe RGB profile instead. The danger with profiles is that some software out there don't embed the profiles. And if you look at these two files, which should appear identical, they actually have different RGB numbers, which basically goes to show you those RGB color coordinates are meaningless unless we also have the color space, which are basically their map references. But if we don't know the scale of the map, we could be anywhere on the planet. So this is very important to know. We do need to make sure that our images going up uh, and out to print service providers do contain an embedded profile. Now, the way of losing a profile is if we go and do some additional editing in software that's not Lightroom. For instance, if we take our images out into Photoshop, the default is to go out with a color space called Pro Photo, which is even bigger than Adobe RGB because this will encompass the color gamut of the sensors we've been using and it's in 16 bits per channel. Now JPEGs don't support 16 bits per channel and some of the default export workflows in Photoshop don't embed the profile. So I just wanted to show you that if you are going into Photoshop, if you're coming back into Lightroom and exporting from Lightroom, you will be safe. So it doesn't really matter what profile you go into Photoshop with. But if you start exporting an image from Photoshop onto your desktop, here's one of the dialog boxes, because there's always options in Photoshop, where embed color profile and convert to sRGB are unchecked by default. So if you were to upload this picture of the most cycle to the internet, to Facebook, Instagram, it would look like the one on the right if you hadn't lowered the color space and converted to 8 bits per channel. Okay, so let's take a look at soft proofing. Now, soft proofing is in the develop module. It's in the tools bar. If you go into the um, soft proofing, if you check that box, the highlight and um, uh, shadow clipping warnings are changed to monitor and destination clipping warnings. And this time they're not uh, warning you of luminance clipping. They're warning you of, um, just got a thing that's crept up on my monitor here which is sort of in my way. I can't get out of that, so I'll just carry on talking. I know what the uh, screen says. Um, so we've got um, a monitor. We'll show you um, color gamut um, problems. Uh, that basically, you'll show you the colors on your monitor that it can't display accurately because the gamut of the monitor isn't big enough. The destination warning is usually you're picking up a printer profile and you're seeing whether those colors are manageable by the printer, 
paper ink set that you've chosen to go out on. So what I'm showing you here is an Apple uh, iMac monitor, which are often considered not to be that bad, but see how much it struggles um, showcasing that yellow. Remember, it's an RGB monitor, so it doesn't actually have any native yellow, and it's really struggling with that saturated yellow. So there may be detail in that yellow surface that the monitor can't actually show you. So if we switched over to a print workflow where yellow is one of the inks in the ink set, this is going to struggle less. Now, one of the things, the great thing about soft proofing is we can load in several um, destination profiles for different printers, different papers. And so just by looking at a different paper surface, I can find a paper where this image comfortably fits into the gamut without me having to edit the saturation of these yellows lower. So I literally can have my cake and eat it. I can have the rich saturation and I can have the detail so long as I choose my print workflow carefully. That was a lot of information to go through, admittedly. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions now. So, uh, but I'll just finish on this slide because uh, this is uh, the website of Image Science. Jeremy is an absolute guru when it comes to all matters to do with color management and printing. And he will definitely, if you're anywhere in Australia, he will be your guru, your go-to guru to make sure that you're getting the best possible workflows now, if you haven't heard me speak before, just head over to my website, which is markgaylor.com. All of my learning resources are free to download, and then you simply donate if you found it useful. That donation is quite important because no one pays me to make these resources. So I do work on donations only to create this huge amount of resources. And these resources include a vast array of 400 page ebooks linking out to more than 40 video tutorials on YouTube. I also have a very active alpha YouTube channel with over 100,000 subscribers. And um, if you're looking for a mentor to work with you over an extended period of time, I also have a Patreon site where you can subscribe from five, 10 or $50. And uh, $50 may sound like a lot uh, per month, but I'm sure you that uh, my students at RMIT University used to pay 10 times more of this for me to un un offload the, my knowledge about photographic workflows to them. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. So we'll stop sharing that are coming in. Either uh, Jeremy might want to unmute his microphone. Yes, I've just done that, Mark. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm standing by ready to answer some questions if you have them. I'm, I'm typing a few yeah. answers in to the little question and yeah. answer block at the same. Question from Jason. He said, how would you rate an IMAX screen? Uh, look, uh, I'm going to be... Um, They've got a little bit better. I think Jeremy's probably the expert on this. I've always said that if I had to give marks out of 10 for an IMAX screen, I'd give it five. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, look, I think that's about right. They're, they're not truly awful, um, but they're not particularly wonderful from a colour perspective either. Um, they have a lot of fairly fundamental problems. Uh, the fused glass design makes them far too glossy. Yeah, they, um, the gloss is a problem. They didn't used to be gloss, but they, they got better um, um, a couple of years back when they, they made them 10-bit, didn't they, Jeremy? Uh, they did, yeah. They brought 10-bit support um, to the Mac in about late 2015, early 2016, I think. Um, yeah. So the hardware dates from that era, that, that has helped improve the smoothness of the gradients on the monitors. That's but right. You still have some issues with yeah. uniformity. Um, you often have, uh, unfortunately, Apple have gone off on their own path, as they, as they tend to do. Um, and they're using a, a, a gamut called uh, Display P3 rather than going for the full Adobe RGB gamut. Yeah. Which is it's a little bit more movie uh, or film oriented um, yeah. than Adobe RGB, which is a little bit more print oriented. Um, but all in all, they're, they're not terrible. You can certainly do okay work on them, but it would be fair to say yeah. if photography is a passion of yours, then buying a high quality monitor um, is, is really worth its weight in gold. I'm, I'm always telling people that the only tool in your entire photographic toolkit that you will use for 100% of your images um, in the modern world is your monitor. It is uh, quite simply the most important tool that you have. It's a, it's a very good point, Jeremy. I think one of the things that I'm always surprised about is somebody will invest in um, you know, a four or $5,000 camera, like a, an A7R3 or an A7R4, 
and they they've spent less on the monitor than they would have done um, a cheap uh, prime lens and um, and really they're, they're never actually looking at how fabulous their camera is because um, it's you know they're, they're, they're limited to seeing either resolution because the monitor is not 4k or they're limited in the color gamut that their camera is capable of so i always think that um after you've got your first couple of lenses under your belt you should really um, reward yourself with a really uh, a color accurate monitor all right i'm also on uh, there's some questions in the little question and answer um box there um, the first one actually might be um, one you might want to have a, uh, an answer to um, from Jules over uh, Hi Jules, haven't uh, spoken in a while, um, which is about a, a workflow for exporting images from Lightroom to be printed in a book in uh, CMYK printing. Yeah, one of the um, advances, uh, it was probably again a couple of years ago, but um, uh, the, uh, the soft proofing, it, it, it didn't used to respect or you couldn't load in CMYK profiles. Um, but then they changed that so you could. Obviously, uh, a lot of people were going out to a blurb because there's a book module in Lightroom, but it seemed a bit um, weird that you couldn't actually um, check whether your images that you were preparing for your blurb book were too saturated or not. Obviously, they've changed that workflow now. Um, so the important thing is to be able to get hold of profiles either from your print service provider or the lab who's going to be printing your book um, so that you can actually um, have an idea of what you're going to be presenting to whoever makes the book is going to be manageable. And um, then, then basically you can export them with a color space that is, is suitable um, for where they're going. Usually what you do is you export your images to a certain CMYK standard. So um, you would consult with the printer. Um, generally, they would tell you something like uh, we're using or we're hitting the Fogger 29 standard, in which case you would export your images, or more to the point, you would, um, uh, sorry, convert your images into Fogger 29, um, and you would check them in Photoshop um, before you then submit them for publishing. Yeah. And ideally, they will be able to produce accurate proofs for you, um, and there are entire companies devoted to doing pre-press proofing. Yeah, one of the things I could add there is if you're limited by what you can export from Lightroom, because you can't export CMYK images from Lightroom, you would uh, open them up in a good, a large color space, maybe even Pro Photo 16 bits, and then um, export them from Photoshop um, into a CMYK. Always remember to uh, get in touch with your printer. And if the printer seems to be confused, they just say, oh, just convert to sRGB. And they're going, so what profile are you using? And, what, and they say, what do you mean, what profile? Just put the phone down and ring somebody who's a little bit more knowledgeable about color management. Um, so uh, Russell was just asking if, uh, if, if uh, Benki have recorded this webinar and if it will be later for, uh, available for watching again. Yes, yes, it is. It will be on the, uh, the Benki YouTube page. Oh, great. Yeah. And Jules, yeah, you're exactly right there. Yeah, convert it in Photoshop and have a look at it in there. So Lightroom really is just not, not designed for a CMYK workflow, but Photoshop has lots of tools in that area. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that um, there are very few programs that can actually um, work towards CMYK. And it's almost like we live in an RGB world. And what often happens is um, uh, the, like my publisher I used to do the CMYK conversions, but then they got a little bit lazy and they started requesting that I do the CMYK conversions. Now, remember, there's always a word of warning here. If you're converting to CMYK, you're basically exporting for one printer, paper, ink set combination. Those CMYK files are not suitable for anything else. And if you're working for a client, you're sort of carrying a, a level of responsibility now because if the, uh, the pamphlets or the book or the magazine all comes out green, uh, everybody's going to point the finger and said, who did the CMYK conversions? I've all, I always used to say to my RMIT students, if, um, if a client is asking you to convert to CMYK, charge them more because you're now managing a part of the workflow, which typically photographers never had to manage. And that includes talking to the printer, looking at uh, printer proofs, signing printer proofs, <laughs> and that's a, that's a little bit of a management saga that really, you know, um, the client needs to pay for. Yeah, sure. It, it can get quite um, complex quickly, um, for sure. 
the um, um, so I'm, sorry, I keep seeing all these new questions popping up. Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a question here: individual custom-made paper profiles for printing, or by a program that contains profiles for all papers. Look, you can do um, you can do both. For example, um, if you bought a, a program like Mirage um, to to run your Epson or Canon printer, you can then get media packages, which include a lot of fairly high quality profiles um, for entire libraries from, say, Ilford or Hanamula or whoever it is you might be printing with. That being said, um, there still is individual variance in uh, printers. So it, it is fair to say that custom profiles are still well and truly worth it for the absolute best results. If you really, really want to get um, really high quality printing going on, the best path is a high quality calibrated monitor. So a BenQ or something like that, calibrated with an i1 display probe. Then say an Epson or Canon um, high-end inkjet printer, something like the Epson P800 and then custom printer profiles specific for the paper that you're printing on. Once you have all of those things in place, then you will be able to, uh, or then you will have an extremely tightly controlled color loop and you will find that getting images that match between your screen and print um, uh, really becomes, you know, just a day-to-day -day event. Um, and that brings me to the next question there, which is when proofing on screen for print, how close is the result versus what is on screen? viewed on the S2, SW271 calibrated. Given that paper is not backlit, do we need to adjust or boost exposure uh, for print? Look, that's a great and classic um, question, Alex. Um, here's the thing, when you calibrate a monitor for print work, you are doing a few things to make that monitor a better predictor of the final printed output. So one of the primary things that you do is you turn the brightness way down. You calibrate usually to a fairly low candela figure for brightness, usually about 100 candelas or possibly even a little bit lower. Um, and another key thing that you do is you reduce the contrast of the screen. So a screen just out of the box running at sort of full whack um, might display about 1,000 to 1 as its contrast ratio, which means that white is 1,000 times brighter than the black that the screen is displaying. Now, that's way beyond the contrast of prints. So during calibration, you turn the contrast down and post-calibration, you'll often end up with a, with a contrast ratio that's more like 200 or 250 to one. And that is much, much, much closer to the printed output. So the short answer is, if you do everything correctly and you calibrate your monitor specifically for print work, then you should see a near perfect match on about 99% of images between your screen and your print. Hopefully that answers your question. There are always little caveats um, and um, uh, you know, there are some images that, that simply look great on monitors that don't look fantastic when printed. For example, um, backlit images tend to look wonderful on monitors and pretty miserable in print. But by and large, once you've got a good monitor, properly calibrated and custom printed profiles, that's when you finally achieve color nirvana and you know, your significant color problems go away. Okay, so I've got a, I can see a question from Daniel here, which says, does selecting the Adobe RGB 1998 profile bint, built into the display setting on a Mac suffice for covering the color space you mentioned earlier? Typically, Daniel, you use the um, a monitor space. Uh, Adobe RGB is often referred to as a working space. It's not linked to a specific device. Um, these uh, working spaces I cover in my color management ebook. So you can see the differences between device spaces and working spaces. Now, so you're going to leave your monitor in its um, a monitor space, and obviously, you can um, better that monitor space that so Adobe uh, ships you that monitor with by uh, creating your own monitor space. And then uh, that is going to get you the best possible gamut that you can on that particular monitor. So hopefully that answers that. Color management is quite a, a sticky subject, but once you've got a color managed workflow set up and it's working for you, it carries on working for you. Um, it, you, you know, it's not something that you have to work on every week. Once you've understood it and set it up, it stays set up. Okay, thank you. Um, we probably have time for about one more question. Um, did you guys? Okay, I can, I can probably knock off a couple there from Redmi7 who's just posted two quick ones together. Yeah. Um, so basically he's asking, do you need a special card um, to achieve eight, uh, 
well, to achieve 10 bit with the BenQ monitors. If you're using a current Mac, the answer is no, 10 bit is built into all the current Macs. If you're using a PC, the answer is yes, you'll want to get an NVIDIA workstation card or an ATI workstation card. These are sold under the uh, Quadro or Fire Pro lines. My advice is that you go for NVIDIA Quadro um, because they tend to have the most stable drivers. And once you have that going on, achieving 10 bit is um, usually um, quite simple from there. Um, and in terms of what mode do you use on the BenQ monitors uh, for editing, um, my advice is if you're just using presets, so you're not calibrating, um, then you're probably uh, better off, yes, using either the SRGB mode or Adobe RG mode, as long as you understand the difference between those. If you don't understand the difference, then sRGB mode is the way to go. Um, on the other hand, if you are calibrating, then you will be using one of the calibration modes on the monitor, um, and that is definitely the, the way to go if you can uh, if you can get yourself a calibrator. Uh, I, I can see a question from Brian there saying there's a distinct color difference between the images he's seeing in Lightroom and the exports on the same monitor. Now, the question that I would uh, want to ask there is how are you viewing those JPEG exports? Because if the software you're using to view those exported JPEGs is not color managed, then um, it may not be being able to replicate what Adobe is doing. Remember, all Adobe software is color managed, so it should move between Lightroom and Photoshop. Now, there, obviously, as we're coming down in color space, there is going to be some minor differences, but you shouldn't see huge differences unless you're starting to view images in um, software that isn't basically color managing. Now, some um, systems are set up and will color manage system wide. Some some systems will not do that. And I, I suspect Jeremy's probably got more answers to that question than I do. Uh, I did if I wasn't typing an answer to another one at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it was I was about exports from Lightroom looking different after exported. And I said it depends how those... Yeah, it depends how you're viewing them. You're exactly right yeah. there, Mark. Yeah. Um, yeah, more than likely um, what you're doing is exporting them from Lightroom, possibly into a, a, another color space. I mean, Lightroom's default presentation is essentially in, in Profoto, a very wide color space. Yeah. So if you're looking, you know, uh, you're on an Adobe RGB monitor um, and you're looking at your image and it's in profile, you're seeing, well, potentially you're seeing very saturated colour. If you then, for example, do an sRGB export and open that up in some other colour managed application, then absolutely you would expect your image to shift fairly dramatically. You know, all your yeah. saturated colours would disappear and, and so forth. But the answer, the full answer to that question can get quite technical and you're more than yeah. welcome, Brian, to contact me um, offline. There's a contact form on our website and um, I'd be happy to go through that in more detail for your specific circumstance. Yeah, that's, that's where having uh, somebody like Jeremy or maybe myself, more on the capture side myself, the workflow side, but certainly having somebody who is um, uh, free with their information. Um, uh, I know Jeremy's uh, website is a treasure trove of interesting stuff uh, to work through that um, you can be very well educated. I think Jeremy's got a book's worth of useful information on that website you should, uh, you should uh, avail yourself of. Yeah, and to the person asking PD or SW, um, if you're into photography, I would strongly recommend the SW version, the direct hardware calibration uh, systems. Um, and the increased uniformity and so forth might make the SW series well worth the extra money. Um, here in Australia anyway, um, the SW monitors all come with a hood, um, so you don't need to purchase one separately. Um, I think in other markets they have separated them out, um, but they are definitely available. Um, stock issues are definitely an issue pretty much everywhere at the moment because of the whole pandemic um, scenario. There's been a, a real stampede um, to people buying monitors. So, yep, there are a lot of stock issues, but um, I know that BenQ locally have quite a, quite a lot of stock rolling in over the next uh, month or so. So sit tight and I'm sure they'll get you a lovely machine uh, if you ask them nicely. I want to I'll just add on to that, those SW monitors. One of the things that I really love about my SW monitor is it's got a little puck and it basically uh, it's got four buttons on it and um, if I'm doing something for the web I can uh, press number one and if I'm doing something that's uh, going to end up in print I can press number two uh, and I can quickly move profiles I don't have to get my profiling device out and do the whole thing again I can just it, it's quite capable of storing multiple profiles and I can quickly toggle between uh, those profiles I think it's a really well thought out and I have to say that I'm really enjoying 
enjoying looking at a 4K monitor. Um, a 4K monitor is great when you're um, sitting quite close to a 27 inch screen and you can just lean in to see whether it's sharp. Um, you're not always aware that it's pixelated because um, it's just HD. You're getting that um, fabulous rendition. I, I'm still enjoying my SW monitor after all of these years. Good. I think we've covered most of the questions that are there, um, but I, I, I'm happy to repeat that um, um, if anybody has any questions after this, then uh, just go to the contact form on our website and pop something through. Um, I tend to answer questions all day, every day, so I'm more than happy to ask uh, to answer some more. Um, and uh, I'm extremely familiar with the BenQ range. We've had a, an excellent relationship with them for oh, about seven years now. So um, they have a lovely range of monitors and we'd be happy to help you with them. Okay, so I think that's probably all we've got to do to, to, tonight. So we'll just uh, sign off and, uh, and hopefully um, we'll be back online sometime in the future.